This is Ashmore Things Dentistry. Welcome to the place where we're passionate about those hints and tips in dentistry. So this is probably going to be a long video, and I really apologize in advance. We've got two cases of tooth number. That is not it. I've done that three times now. Tooth number three, six, two different patients. I'm going to try to make sure that I don't mix up who's who. Well, I won't, but try to make sure it's communicated clearly to you who's what. Because in one case, we do a pulpectomy and an incision and drainage. And in the other case, Brad, our buddy, we're going to be doing a start to finish pulp, um, cleaning, shaping, you know, root canal on a tooth number three, six. There's a bunch of tips that I've been taught that I wanted to share with you, including, you know, what's the outcome of incision and drainage procedure in endodontic patients? So this is a new article, relatively new, within the past, ooh, it's not that new, actually. Uh, anyways, three years, I thought it was last year. Wow. Time flies when you're getting older, when you've been doing this for 20 years. So... We're going to talk quickly about that, but uh, let's see here. So we've got Brad. Brad present. Brad's a good family friend. This is him feeling his lip. So this is. <laughs> I know it's a bad joke. So this is him numb, and you know Brad's been painful. I'll just keep doing that for a little bit. But actually, let's go to his peri periodical radiograph. So Brad, I met. We were talking with Brad. He's a family friend. He's a former NHL player. Super. Nice guy, great family, three kids, and uh, he retired a few, several years ago from the uh, from the NHL. Why that's important here, I have no idea, but I guess I just wanted to say it. But he presented, and he was telling me we were talking about. Actually, we were talking about a snowmobile with my son, and because I live in Canada, and it's about you know it's snowmobile season, coronavirus and snowmobile. I mean, what else are you going to do when it's coronavirus? Uh, so he was telling me that this tooth had flared up like there's no tomorrow and I remember you know when I went to school 100 years ago we taught used to call this the phoenix abscess so a necrotic tooth you've got some sort of a chronic apical abscess that's what we used to call just this um, asymptomatic apical peritonitis and it flared up you know rose in the ashes of the phoenix abscess and he couldn't sleep one night I think he said he was going to shoot his tooth out I don't think he did because he still has it but, so we got him in, and uh, this is kind of the radiographs here. It's a film. We did an amalgam core, because I love amalgam. Still uh, still using amalgam for a lot of stuff, uh, because this is a core, core restoration. He'll be getting a crown on this down the road. And I put this in here because you can see a fin, and actually this, is, no, this isthmus. So we talk more about um, kind of a lot of stuff in irrigation. This might be long, I don't think it is. We triple checked at working legs. Um, but if I look at this one, it looks nice. So let's just ignore that other radiograph and let's head to some video action here. So this is Brad, we're gonna do his root canal start to finish. Then we had another gentleman last week, the footage wasn't that good, but I did get some incision and drainage footage. So let's just go through the pulpectomy uh, the footage was out of focus, and I was I couldn't believe it. So this tooth, same tooth, different diagnosis. It was this tooth was three six necrotic with ap acute apical abscess, and we elected to do an incision and drainage, which we, I mean, most of us are still trained to do. Um, so we did our we did our you know our access, and you can see slowly the film is right out of, I mean, it's not anywhere near footage in. Uh, focus which is very rare so my buddy imagine in Shriki's place with a amazing like Leica I just didn't set up a microscope but it does I did put it in a focus kind of down the way and the one tip I can tell you about doing a pulpectomy because you see the the pulpectomy start to finish really is uh, let's see 24 minutes and the reason why is because we're we're opening we're opening the coronal two-thirds with our wave one gold primary um, I have a free root canal course put the description box below and really the idea is we're not doing like 10, 8, 6, 8, 10 file pulpectomy, 15, and then sending the patient on their way. We're actually going to be cleaning and shaping to a wave one gold primary or some sort of, you know, rotary file of 20 or 30, 20 or 25 millimeters diameter. There we go. So you can see that um, we're halfway done and we've got our two canals. So our mesial buccal canal, our mesial lingual, and our single distal. Let's see if I can get it in the shot there. And we're going to take our wave and go right to length. So we open a coronal two thirds, we get our working length, and then we're going to clean and shape right to working length with our primary. So that's a 2507. Why I can't, I still can't remember what it is. 2508. So you can see we're getting debris on our cutting flutes at the apical third. And I think we're going to get starting getting some drainage from uh, one of these mesocanals. So we're going to keep doing this. 
cleaning and shaping all the way down to our working knife. So you can see now we're starting to get some drainage here from our meso buckle. Yep, there it comes. And we're going to irrigate out. I don't prefer these tips. We ran out of regular side flute, side vented. These are, I would say, not ideal, but we're going to use them for this appointment. And then we're going to keep cleaning and shaping. So this is pretty monotonous here. Pretty standard. We're getting rid of all the necrotic tissue, all the debris, all the bacteria, viruses. I don't know. Is there coronavirus in a tooth? I'm not sure. I doubt it. But so you see, we've got drainage in the mesial canals. We're opening up everything. We're going to give it good irrigation. And that's pretty much what we want to do is we want to get kind of the nidus of our problem out of there, which is our bacteria. And then we're going to just re, you know, recheck our working lengths, make sure we're good to go, write them down. And then get, let me just speed this up here, get set up for, we're going to play some calcium hydroxide. Now what I do for calcium hydroxide is one day I was sitting there thinking, why am I just using a 10 file? Why am I, why am I using a lentulo? Um, I don't like lentulos. Oh, it's, I never have them to be honest. And you can see here. So that was a perfect image right there. You can see how we've opened up everything. This is just a pulpectomy. We've opened up our entire chamber. We make sure we got, you know, using the laws of symmetry from Krasner and Rankow in 2004. Uh, we're following the, you know, the dark path in the bottom of the, the pulpal floor, floor chamber, floor chamber, the floor, the floor of the pulp chamber. We've got our uh, distal canal opened up. And you can see that, you know, you really need to open up these orifices to get our irrigant down there to make sure we're, we're trying to change we're trying to change the environment for the for that tooth, so the body can then start solving the problem on its own. So we're going to be cleaning, and, you know, drying. You're going to see these these points will not dry. So that's one of the big determinants for me. I think a lot of us that you know, how do you know when to to finish a root canal? How do you not? Well, one of the biggest ones is can you get the canal space dry? That's it. If it's dry and you're not getting any seepage from the apical portion, you know, nine times out of ten, you're good to go. Unless it's a super symptomatic tooth, then you might want to think twice. Uh, but, you know, put in your comments below. What are your thoughts? That's what I've been doing for a long time, and it seems to work for me, and that's kind of the advice I've been given. You can see here as I pull the points out, it's still wet, so we're not going to finish that. So what we're going to do is one day I was sitting there in a plastic tooth thinking, why, can't, why don't I just spin this? We even go file backwards or forwards because it cuts in the reverse through reverse direction. Just spin it at like 1200. There's an article talking about what speed for lentulos to, to spin and get the most coverage of calcium hydroxide. I think it was like 1400 RPM. So I spin it around 1000 to 1200 RPM in reverse, which is actually forward. And then that's it. I stay about three millimeters short of the working length. And let's just get it here. Well, we're wasting a lot of time there. We were looking for the calcium hydroxide. That's what it was. So you can see here, there's still drainage from the mesial buccal canal. This is this is uh, calcium hydroxide. We call it multi-cal. There's lots of different preparations of it. And I'm just placing, I'm literally placing, you can see I fill the pulp chamber. I'm not going to stick it down the canals because it's fairly caustic. I want to keep it in the tooth. And then I'm going to take my wave on gold, spin it. And let's just hit play. And it's literally, I'm just going to pump it up and down. I'm saying three millimeters short of my working length. You know, I talk with my buddy Al, uh, Les, who I, t who I taught on uh, root canals with, he's an endodontist, you know, he takes a 10 file down the length, pumps it a few times, and we're good. Everyone's got a different way of doing it. I don't think there's a right or wrong. There is a wrong, uh, but I don't think there's like, you know, wrong is extruding it out the apex of your tooth. Now, that is not good. Depending. I mean, we're talking, if we're getting on the inferior alveolar nerve, that's definitely not a good thing. So what you're seeing here is I'm just literally placing my cotton pellet. Remember there's, you know, you can see there's probably about three to four millimeters of pulp ch of uh, restoration here. So I'm going to place my, my cavet right on top of that. I'm not placing a cotton pellet. You know, I was reading this one, uh, this Endolit uh, app, and they talk about having little fibros of cotton pellets. And I remember watching that, you know, thinking about like, that's a path for bacteria to get into your into your pulp chamber. So what I do, what I've been doing now is just scrapping the, uh, I don't even use a sponge. I find a sponge is really hard to get out if you uh, can't get it out. I'll just literally place this here and place my cabinet on top, on top of my calcium hydroxide and we're good. Because there's enough calcium hydroxide in the pulp chain to prevent this restoration from going into the orifice. So enough about that. We're going to take a rubber dam off and we're going to reset the microscope and we're going to do a quick IND. It's a very, this is a very simple procedure, this one. 
let's get over there we go so what we're going to do here he had flexion with swelling it was very painful and i'm just going to make an incision now the thing is i've been taught i've read been taught talked to so many different people you can do it a vertical incision because the blood flow uh is you know coming all over the place but they talk about having a vertical incision what i elected to do is just make it really simple whether it's right or wrong you can place your comments below i'd like to hear what you have to say um i just made a simple buckle incision just in the just right at the maximum maximum point of kind of where it was fluctuant that is wrong potentially some people i mean i've been taught both ways right in the middle let it all flow out like you're going to see here some people say don't do it you know do it on healthy tissue i don't even know if there's a right or wrong way so you can see we've got a bunch of uh some pus and blood there's a lot of blood flow out of there is that good you know <clears throat> i've done a, i've done many of these probably hundreds of these and then you get into where there's no nothing you've just got this indurated mass with there's nothing that drains and you just kind of think wow and then like oh, okay well i'm changing the environment right that's what it is i'm changing the environment from an anaerobic to an aerobic environment that's what i'm doing so i'm doing a blunt dissection just with if you want to get really aggressive or the right way you could argue is you take hemostats have them closed and then open them and pull back so that's the way i was trained and then rinse us out really at the end of the day you're just trying to get some of that pus out of there change the environment and we're done now one of the things that I did want to mention, it's in the it's in the links below, and I, I really appreciate if you read it. This was published, I thought, last year, but apparently it's <laughs> in 2018, which um, I'm starting to get old. But it talks about what's the outcome of an incision and drainage procedure in endodontic patients. And I'm not going to cut to the chase on this one. It's either they did an IND or they did a, a pretend one. And you really need to read the article because as I was doing this procedure and filming and thinking, I want to public, I want to post this for you to read. This one came in the back of my mind, this article. And I want, I'd want i really appreciate if you put your comments below and take a read through it because it's very interesting and it's great because it changes, it potentially might change your mind, but you have to keep in, in you have to also think that there's, I don't, I, there's no validation study of this. It's, this is the first one. So a validation study may totally change it. That reminds you of the argument between perichloroaniline. Is it perichloroaniline, you know, when you mix chlorhexene and sodium hypochlorite, or is it not? Or is it like something else? So they had a bunch of studies and still there's no answer. But anyways, so let's switch over to, so that's at IND. Let's switch over to my buddy, Brad. Um, we're going to do, so this tooth, where are we at? We're going to be doing our, so we're doing our initial exam. We're doing our probing depths. That's pretty boring. So we initially what we did was we palpated. So there we go. Let me start from the beginning. So we're going to palpate. This is the initial exam. We're going to palpate. It was sore along right. Where am I thumb? Not in the order, but uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm just conf because there was a little bit of a exostosis. I don't know if exostosis is just the way it is on the r left side. So I'm confirming on the right side the same thing, and it was. I'm going to turn this down so you hear me uh, crashing and banging. So we're going to do our probing depths. Probing. Yeah, perio. Okay. Anyways, that's, we'll do that. We'll speed through that pretty quick. We're just looking for any, pretty much any uh, bone loss, any type of single uh, single probing depths or multiple probing depths. This is a lateral percussion. My buddy Reagan taught me to do it, and it's tenderer than that. There's no tenderness there. Uh, then we're going to do apical per, apical. I'm not going to hammer it really hard in patients where they don't know which tooth is sore. I will give them a little more of a jolt. Uh, but Brad's a friend and that tooth was, he can with one finger say, yes, that is the tooth that's bugging me. So we're going to, oh, for some reason I didn't go back that. Whoops. So, so nor, I mean, he had a, okay. So my justification for not doing apical <laughs> percussion is that one became symptomatic at that point. So in a normal case, do your apical percussion uh, up and down as well. So then we're gonna switch to cold response. Just ask the patient, you know, you feel cold, yes. Here, and then the 3.5 doesn't do anything. So, so, so that, you know, the thing is it could be warm because it'd been two teeth already, which is a huge possibility. I think we're going to go back to the five and then I don't get a response. Nothing. So I'm like, oh, okay, we'll go to this one. Obviously that one, that 
I'm going to recheck some of these. And it's really funny because sevens always get a cold response. Like if it's alive, it's like quick. I don't know what it is. So we got a cold response on the three five. We're good. Three six is nothing. So All right, man. So that tooth is dead. Well, there we go. You can hear my voice. Definitely. Okay, so, <laughs> so. That's how we just let it out to him. <clears throat> Your tooth is dead. And uh, so what we're going to do is I'm going to line up. I actually cut a new video on kind of what I do for cases like this. I turn the, the, the microscope over. Um, I have another video that I'm publishing right now uh, talking about symptomatic teeth, not just the inferior alveolar nerve block. Um, there's a great article that talks about symptomatic apical periodontitis or symptomatic irreversibly inflamed teeth or necrotic teeth where they're really painful. So, you know, in a nutshell, right now, whether you agree or not, I, it's, I don't really, it, it's fine. But what I'm doing is I'm at the first, at the end of the day, I'm palping where the mandibular portion of the anterior border of the, the ramus is with my finger. I bend my needle a little bit. I know that's, I'm going to hell for saying that, but I bend it just a little bit and then I'm going to walk my, my needle back from kind of a midpoint here so I go mid between the occlusal planes and mid between my finger and kind of this pillar here and I'm going to start walking my my injection backwards that's it and you know what I've been trained by other mentors and it seems to work for me is I'm going to go all the way back to where it drops and the next video will talk about kind of the drop and what tissues or what anatomy is there but then I'm also just going to kind of use this area to kind of use a general like you know some here drop 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 some here I'll be three using three carps and of course my long buckle and that kind of you know I'm just kind of using a generalized area you know I've been doing endo for almost a decade now straight you got to make sure you got your solid anesthesia and I'm trying you know you're trying your best and the last thing is as I'm injecting I'm doing very slow drops like this injection here will take me three minutes very slow drops because the only thing that matters to patients is how much pain you put them through we're going to, of course, do our aspiration. So I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm going to do a few more, blah, blah, blah. You can see all them. But the, one of the important things I wanted to go through was right there is doing a PDL. So usually I'll use a LigmaJet. I'll do this in patients with pain, um, especially the percussion pain. What I'm going to do is I'll tap. Let me see here if I tap. I think just with him, I just went and did it. Um, what I'll do is I'm trying to make sure that I can't replicate their symptoms before I get started. So if a patient is, that's actually quite funny look there, right there. So if a patient has, is irreversibly inflamed, I'm going to cold test before I get started. So I'm going to cold test this, or if I, per, so say there's the necrotic in this case, but there's apical periodontitis, symptomatic apical periodontitis, what I'll do is I'll percuss and if they still feel it, outcomes. This is not a ligma jet. I don't have one ligma jet in this clinic, but what I do have are these eight millimeter short needles you can see how short they are and they're super stiff they're 30 gauge and i'm going to do a, a pdl injection so one on the mesial and one on the distal this right here will save you don't even need the ligma jet just get this little needle i'm going to use you know half a carp so a quarter carp in the front quarter carp in the back and i'm going to put a lot of pressure sometimes i'll take both hands on the syringe and place place pressure there we go now i got it in, there we go better so i'm going to place it right in the in the mesial Sometimes it hurts when I first place it, so I go nice and gentle. Remember, the first, the only thing patients feel are, they only remember you by how much pain you put them through. So we're going to go nice and slow, I'm putting a lot of pressure. And, um, you know, I mean, this stuff tastes like hell. I mean, anesthetic just tastes bitter. So what I tell them, and I say, well, it's, I'm sorry, I've doused you with some really bad tasting things, but if everything tasted good in dentistry, there'd be lineups outside. So kind of the reason why we make it taste bad. It's a pretty bad joke, but so I'm going to put some in the front, some in the back. I'm going to make sure I sink that needle. You can see as well, also the tissue starting to blanch. You can argue left, right, and center that potentially there are no human studies that talk about the detrimental implications of doing a PDL, but I can tell you that when you're dealing with a patient, a lot of pain, that is the last thing on your mind about having problems with, your, with uh, you know, the, the PDL at the end of the day. And having cold and depths they just want to be out of pain and you want to help them so you can see here you can also use an intraosseous but that's pretty quick that's what i use that for so it'll be a block three blocks three blocks and then uh, a long buckle and then 
do my PDL, I'll recheck. You can see I just keep hammering. Let's see if we can hear that. No pain. We are ready. We're ready to rock. So this way, I have confidence that my anesthesia works. A patient has confidence that their anesthesia works. And again, if this patient was, if he was irreversibly inflamed, I'd be putting a cold test on there right before we got started. And I do that with restorative because how many times have you started feeling and the patient feels it, and you burn out like two hours of your time trying to get, trying to chase the numbness. I find it's like the tickle trunk. Once you tickle your kids and you go to tickle them again, they, you don't even have to touch them. They get, they're laughing. So. This is placing the uh, place a rubber uh, button block, bite block. We're gonna place a rubber dam. We're gonna place their secondary seal on there, and then off we go. We're gonna light cure it. So he has a previous restoration on there. You can see it's a composite restoration, and it appears that when they first place it, I'm sure they hit the horn or were really close. Um, so it was just a matter of time of that tooth becoming necrotic. So I'm using a number four, four surgical round burr. I'm gonna remove all that restoration out of that. Out of the uh, out of the out of the uh, the tooth, and then what I'm going to do is hold on, I whip past it. So I'm going to make a small hole with my number four. It's going to go drop. You see that drop right there? Watch, ding. So what that was is because I know that our pulp chamber is fairly, you know, it's got a fairly good size. You can see some of it here as well. So I'm just going to drop it in. I'm going to make a small yeah. little. Perfect weather. We're talking about our weather out here, like, you know Ottawa. Really it's actually quite a fun entertaining appointment so what we're doing here is we're checking to see if it's necrotic and then we're going to do that's all i need i'm going to make that small little hole and i'm going to take my endo zebra and run that along the pulp chamber floor oh by the way brad wanted me to put uh, he i said we're going to post this so he can i think he's so he's watching by about now i think probably watching what his tooth looks like so we got some, we'll see what, what happens is we put it into that little spot. We see what happens. I'm going to, I'm leveling off the cusp tips because what this does is it gives me a great stable reference point for working length. There's nothing more difficult than trying to, um, try to thread the needle. Like if you're, tr in a, if you're in a rush to try to like, sew something, you're trying to thread the needle and there's nothing worse than having inclined planes to get your working length. So these are the mesial canals here. You can see that, let's see, we've got a bit of an opening here, but and we'll manage it. We've got our mesial lingual. You can see here in the mirror. So I go straight down. There's a mesial lingual. There's our orifice right there. There's our mesial buckle right here. And then there's our channel. That we're going to follow right down to the distal. So we're going to take our endo zebra, follow that down. And let's get all that stuff done. And what we're going to do, the next spot that I want to show you is using, so we did all that. I don't want to make this video too, too long, is using a Munzburr. So I've got a Munzburr here. This is the website. If you haven't used these before, these are amazing long troughing burrs. So they're like 31 millimeters long. And what I'm doing is I'm using it to open up the pulp chamber a little bit more, but I'm also, before I get into showing you, I want to show you what they are. I'm using the number, um, number two, I think. And they're just 31 millimeter length burrs. And you can see how I'm using them. I'm actually using them to trough, to remove any... This is the mesials here, and I'm just troughing in the distal. So I'm looking for middle mesial. I'm trying to open up the distal just to see if we've got another chamber. Make sure in the chamber. Make sure we have two. So you can see here how that Munzburr works. So I skipped from the roots, the endo zebra, and now I'm using the Munzburr. And what I did was I literally just trough from one orifice to the other, and then the distal. What I did was I just troughed right along the right along the distal orifice just to make sure that I'm miss, not missing a distal orifice because one of the most common I was just I was listening to a, a, um, a speaker the endodontist about a month ago and I you know the most common second most common canal missed is a distal lingual and I totally agree with that because I've missed a bunch too so making sure you open up this to make to make sure you get all of the contents of that orifice let me go back here I just want to make sure I get a better so what I'm doing because that wasn't very clear actually so so what I'm doing is I'm going from one orifice to the other in the mesial lingual in the mesial so I'm just literally going from there's the mesial lingual I'm going back and forth a little bit in the mesial mesial lingual back and forth between the two orifices I'm dropping it I'm pushing actually what I'm doing is I'm pushing towards the mesial so we're not getting into the furcation 
and I'm dropping it probably about a millimeter to almost two millimeters below the pulpal floor. And that gives us an opportunity to look and seek out if there's a middle mesial. Now what I might do is this little bit of dent in here, I might remove that. I can't remember if I do with an endozebra or just leave it because I get I can see what I'm doing. And then we're going to do, so you can see here I've cleaned that out. Once you once you rinse it out, you'll see how much better you can see. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to track down and get to the distal and go, you know, buckle lingual again, just to make sure that we find all orifices, if there are two or just one. Super handy burr. I'm telling you, you pack of these a lot. You know, I would say I'd recommend getting, oops, that's not it. That's, that's it here. I would recommend getting a variety pack. You can only buy them from CJM Engineering. I'm not sponsored by him, uh, by these folks. As I ended on Dr. Munts. Um, get a variety pack because they get really big to really small. What I use normally are purple and white. That's all I've been using. I ordered these gray ones by accident, and for what I do is way. These are way too small, uh, but these seem to be good for MB2 and middle mesial canals. All right, let's keep going here. So we're gonna rinse that out. So you can see, there we go. I'm not even going to rinse it out. What we're going to do is we're, going to, we're just going to attack it with the wave on gold. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to literally into the cutting flutes. I'm opening up the coronal two, two thirds. You could argue that this is right or wrong, not having irrigant in the canal. I haven't broken one of these yet doing this. So I'm pretty solid. I'm, I'm confident, but I've broken a lot in extracted teeth. So one of the beauties of these, uh, not even just this file, but the like Vortex Blue, all the edge files, the heat treated, is you can bend the heck out of it just to get it into that orifice. And we're trying to get into that mesial buckle. And let's just speed along here. So we irrigated it out again. Again, this is the same place. We still haven't gotten the side vented needles, so don't use those. So actually, that was really interesting. So if you have a hard time, I had a hard time, I can't remember what it was, but you see when I use the number six file on a pair of cotton forceps, if you have a really hard time, this is a super easy technique to get your file into the canal. So it's bent. So the file is bent. You can see it's bent towards this. And then I use my cotton forceps to angle it into that, into that orifice, and then boom, you're done. And then you can kind of you know wiggle around with your with your hands. So that's one technique because sometimes I've noticed, like especially new dentists are trying to do, you know, the gymnastics with the fingers and try to get that file in and it's, it slows down so much. So we're just gonna get our working length. This is a pretty straightforward case. Took about 45 minutes, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, actually we had a, our, a, my apex locator actually kind of died halfway through. So we do have a backup. So there is some downtime we're switching. That's why I'm using, you can see, I'm apex locating a lot, and my the old school apex root ZX is not reading very well, so I think it might be hitting its days. It's probably like 30 years old, and I love it. But uh, so there's some downtime here. I just switched out, so I got my working length. I'm actually to speed up things. What I elected to do was just use a wave and go glider uh, after my 10 file, and then we're going to go to working length with my primary. Again, this is a pretty straightforward case. You can see we've got. A fairly large ovoid canal in the distal. I think there might be two, or it definitely there's a fin on one of those. And then our two mesial canals, there's no middle mesial in this case. We search that out and we're going to reconfirm our working lengths. There we go. Look at that. Nice and clear. So it is fairly ovoid and then it goes down to one canal, but there is a fin on one side. And you can see we've troughed. There is no, I couldn't get a stick on anything for a middle mesial. So let's just keep going here. Oh, see, now there's a different apex locator. So this is actually built into the chair. It's really interesting. I think it's called a Serona chair. It's from Germany. It's crazy. It does everything. And even like, I think it actually gives you a the not just the patient a massage, like the operator massage. So it's got a built-in apex locator. Um, so you can see here again, I'm having trough time, trough time, a tough time, trough time talking and a tough time getting my files in. So I'm going to use... Uh, this, we're going to get our final working lengths and then we're going to use our wave and gold medium, irrigate that out, some downtime, I don't know what's going on, I can't remember, there we go, so we use our wave and gold medium, yes I'm using a 31 because in real life we run out of files sometimes, we don't reuse them, but we do run out of them, 
So it can be a headache to get that file in there. Uh, fortunately, we're okay to get it in there. And that's one of the beauties of being of you, these heat treated, they bend. And we're gonna just keep going, we're gonna clean. One of the things I was taught is to make sure you brush. You know, like when you're cleaning a sink, you just don't put soap in it, you know, especially if it's really dirty. So what I'm doing is I'm brushing up and down, not all the way to my working knife, back and forth, especially my distal canal, because it's ovoid. So make sure we get all that tissue or any necrotic debris or any the coronavirus out of the side of the tooth. Uh, just using it like a brush, like literally a metal brush. So there we are at a length. And what you just saw there is I had full debris on my flutes. So I'm really happy with that. If I see debris, not if I see these clean and debris starting here, it means I have nine times out of 10, it means I've overshot my working length and now I'm cutting into bone. That's not good. Or into the lesion. So, the, so what I'm seeing here is that yes, I'm at the right working length. So I think. But yes, I'm getting good cutting. Yes, I'm cleaning, you know, I'm machining the inside of the canal. There's a whole bunch of yeses to that. So now I'm slowly getting rid of that debris. My, my chamber's full. So what I'm doing actually is I'm just literally cleaning out my flutes in the irrigant as I bring it out. So we were actually quite, we were bantering quite back and forth because Brad's such a great guy. And then I think we did this around five o'clock at night. So it was a lot of fun. I think getting a root canal is fun. I don't know. Brad, you can put it in the comments below if you want. If you had a fun time. So we're coming up down to our final irrigation protocol. You can see here. Oops. So this is what we got. We've got again. Clean and shaped. I don't even know what to say. We've got just clean and shaped. So we're going to use our sonic activation. And then we're going to irrigate with our EDTA. I'm going to speed through all this because it's actually quite boring. We're going to use our check our gutta percha points, take our x ray. So we're doing our final irrigation, whatever protocol you do, we're checking our working lengths. And actually, what you're seeing right here is when I was irrigating, I saw, let's see if I can do it. I was getting, uh, if you aspirate from one ear, one canal and it comes up from the other canal, you know, dry out the other canal, I'm kind of like, hmm, interesting. Where is that? Let me just get that for you because that's actually really important. So let me see if I suction it back. No, not there. I might be able to do it here. So I'm irrigating, irrigating, irrigating. Okay, let's start of the picture here. No, I couldn't do it. So what happened was that when I was irrigating, oh, it might be here. No. Oh, it's out of focus. I'm sorry, guys. So. Um, what I was doing, I'm doing a bit of manual irrigation here to do dynamic uh, manual irrigation, just pumping up and down my cones just to make sure we got the whole system cleaned out. And what I noticed is that at one point <clears throat> when I irrigate, I pulled back my irrigation syringe, I was able to uh, see some of the irrigant come up from one of the other canals. And I'm like, hmm, that's fishy. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, I only had uh, eight files or 10 files. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to 10 file. And I, think, I find you really need a 15 to pull this off. I'm going to take my wave and gold primer. I put it in my uh, in my mesial buckle. Get my fingers out of the way. Gosh. I put my put it in my mesial buckle and then so I put it down there and I see if it scores <coughs> my mesial lingual canal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this gutta percha out and we'll take a look. Oh, I took a 10 file as well. So I'm going to take it out and I'm looking to see if it's actually scored uh, by the file and it's not. So what that tells me is they have two separate orifices. Now if the canals went together, excuse me, <coughs> I don't have coronavirus. Uh, if the canals go together, what happens is you'll see it score. So what this does is it confirms I have two separate or portals of exit and I'm going to clean shape and well, I've already cleaned shape, but I'm going to finish this, go to percha points. I'll make sure that they both go right to length and we're happy. 
So we're going to dry. Oh, so what I do here actually might. What I'm going to do is one of the tips I was taught is to ear aspirate your irrigant. So before you're going to do your final drying, rather than taking power, paper points when this is full, fully full of irrigant and you're going to take forever, I just, what I'll do is I'll take my irrigating syringe and I'll pull back on the, on the plunger and I'll suction all the irrigant out of my orifice, out of the canal, and then I'll dry. I'll place a little bit of air just to kind of blow the, blow all the uh, irrigant out of the way. So we're good there. So same thing, we're gonna check, we're checking for drying, making sure we're at the right working length. And what I'm doing there, as you can see, I put it to length, I bend, so any when paper gets wet, it can bend it. So then what I'm gonna do is I'll measure. I'll do the same thing here. Bend it, make sure we're at the right length. It's another conf, you know, it's another confirmation to make sure I'm at the right working length. Place my sealer. I'll take a 10 file to length, make sure that I get, pop the air bubble that's underneath. I'm getting out of the screen now. I'm going to place our gutter percha points. Just reconfirming everything. I think I was able to get this in the footage here. No, I wasn't able to. So we took our x-ray. This is what popped up. This is our working length x-ray. I was happy with it. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to finish. So we're going to take our heat, touch and heat, sear, sear everything off. Just like that. Do, 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 pretty quick. Pack it down. I'm gonna rinse out like crazy. I put my finger on the air, on the thing on the uh, tooth, and I place both air and water on the syringe and hit it. And then this is what you get, nice and clean. So I'm gonna, you know, just I'm, at this point I tell Dana to hit the gas on the uh, the. Triturator, amalgam mixer thing, and there you go. We're gonna place our amalgam. I'm gonna pack it down in, real quick. This is the beauty of amalgam, and of course he's gonna be getting probably a zirconia crown down the road from his from his uh, dentist. Pack that down there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Check the occlusion. That's it. So that is a couple cases there. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please, you know, take a read through this article. I really appreciate you making it to this point. Subscribe and like and all other stuff. But the thing is, what's really important is kind of, you know, take a read through this and then, you know, place in the comments what your thoughts are. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.